Praise be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I beseech the Father for the sake of his Son to anoint my words, to speak truth without error, and to do it to magnify the Lord Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I ask the Holy Spirit to fill us and embolden us to reach Muslims for the glory of Christ until every Muslim knee bows and every Muslim tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We love you, Father. Please use me, Lord. As you use Ramin and Muhammad, use me for the glory of your Son. We love you, Lord Jesus, and we love you, Holy Spirit. Show up in a mighty way in Jesus' name. <clears throat> you know, this altitude is getting to me. Just walking up the stairs and I'm out of breath. I don't know if that's just discipline for, anyway. Uh, just to give you a little background about who I am, uh, Sam Shamoon, and I'm an apologist. Now, what is an apologist? What I want you to do is turn to your Bibles in 1 Peter chapter 3, and our dear brother Nate will be reading for me because I've gotten into the bad habit of having my audience members read passages aloud. As you can see, I don't have the Bible with me or the Quran with me. It's something that... I started doing in 1999 when the Lord called me in full-time ministry where I'd engage the audience and have them read for me so they can focus on the point and learn how to use the sword of the Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ. And if you guys don't know Nate, Nate, can you stand up? Do you guys recognize this, this uh, soldier? This guy, I'm sorry, man, I know you're, you don't want me, but I got to do it. He is a UFC martial arts fight, fighter. He's a professional mixed martial artist who now fights the kingdom of darkness with the spiritual muscles that Jesus Christ has given him. He's actually a pastor. So thank the Lord Jesus. What an honor because I used to be a big Bruce Lee fan and I'm just simply big right now. No more, you know, but anyway. But if you can, go to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. I'm an apologist and the reason why I'm an apologist is because that's God's gifting. The Lord sets us, sets us apart to preach the gospel, but part and parcel of preaching the gospel is defending what you believe and why you believe it. You cannot do evangelism without the work of apologetics. And I'll demonstrate that for you from the Word of God, not my opinion. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, our brother will read it aloud. And he doesn't have a microphone, but I will stop him at key points and try to break down the meaning of these words inspired by the Holy Spirit. And I want to emphasize this. All of you are Bible-believing Christians, which means that when you read the words of Peter, it's not the words of Peter you're reading, but the words of the Holy Spirit. So these are not the suggestions or opinions of Peter. These are the exhortations and commands of the Holy Spirit telling Peter what to tell the church and how to do it. So here, the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of Peter, exhorts Christians to do the work of an apologist. 1 Peter 3, verse 15. And I'm still working on the meekness part, right? I mean, I'm still a work in progress. I want you to see that in this translation, and he's reading the New King James Version. And by the way, is everyone reading the same translation here? Everyone reading New King James? Anyone reading the NIV? The nearly inspired version? If you are an attentive reader, and you're paying attention and not just reading on the surface level, you're going to notice that his rendering is different from yours. His translation translated the verse differently from the NIV. If you notice, his version says, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. NIV doesn't read that way. NIV reads slightly differently. And that's an issue that will come up in your witness to Muslims. The differences in the versions of the Bible, because as our dear brother Ramin, and pray the Lord continue to use this soldier mightily, and Muhammad Faridi, because we need more soldiers in the field, who are bold enough to lay their lives in order to get Muslims saved. As he said, one of the objections you're going to hear is that your Bible's corrupt. That's a common objection leveled by Muslims against the gospel. Your Bible's corrupt. It's not reliable. We can't take what it says. But in the NIV, can someone read the NIV? Sister, do you have the NIV? What, how does your NIV start in 1 Peter 3.15? Or whoever has the NIV. 
set apart Christ as Lord. But his version said, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. So did it say, set apart Christ as Lord? Or is it saying, the Lord God is the one whom you should sanctify? That is a question hopefully I'll answer before the session is over. And when he said 50 minutes, I want you to keep in mind, he's Middle Easterner. 50 minutes to a Middle Eastern mind means two hours. So we got about two hours by the grace of God. But what's the key? Not to get into the side issue. Here Peter said, always be prepared. Not whether you feel like it, whether you want to. Always be prepared in season, out of season. It doesn't matter how you feel. Always be prepared to give a defense. His translation rendered the Greek defense. Now, I don't know if the NIV says defense or answer. Did it say answer or defense? Answer. Either English term is an appropriate term for the Greek. Now, again, I'm not a Greek scholar, but I do want to bring out the word used in the Greek because when this was written, it was not written in English. It was written in the common Greek spoken by the common person in the first century. And there, if you do read the Greek, the Greek words are pros apologian. Now I'm giving you the Erasmian way of pronouncing the Greek. A Greek speaker hearing someone trying to read the Greek New Testament, they'll get a good laugh. Pros apologian. <laughs> right? They'll laugh because that's not how they pronounce it. Pros apologian. Does that word sound familiar? Apologian? That's the word from which you get apologetics. Apologetics, apologist, comes from this very Greek word used by the Spirit. In other words, if I were to capture the gist of what Peter is saying by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is commanding every member of the body of Christ, be ready to be an apologist for Jesus Christ. Be ready to do apologetics for the glory of Christ. But here's the question. How can you defend the faith you don't know? Let me repeat the question again. How can you defend the faith that you do not know? And if you do not know it, are you truly living the way the Lord wants you to live? See, I want those questions to be etched in your hearts and your minds. If you don't know the faith, you can't defend it. And if you don't know the faith, then you can't live it. And God didn't waste his time in giving us a collection of books, if you're Protestant, 66, filled with instructions on how to live a life to give your utmost for his highest. He didn't waste his time in giving you the collection of books of how to live for the glory of Christ because God is serious. He wants all of you, not some of you, not most of you. He wants all of you every day, every second, every minute of your life. And that's why we call him Lord, right? So here we're commanded to do the work of an apologist. Not only that, let's see what Paul said about his own ministry. Let's go to Philippians. I have to cover a lot of ground with the time allotted to me, so I'm going to do my best by the grace of God, knowing that we serve a God of the miraculous. And as he slowed the sun down, he can slow the minutes down. Amen? He did it for Joshua. He can do it for us. Amen? All right. Let's go to Philippians chapter 1. Paul is my hero. Jesus is my God. He's infinitely greater than a hero, right? But of all the men and women that God has raised, Paul is my hero. I pray that the Lord Jesus will make every one of us like Paul in his zeal and his passion and love for Jesus Christ. He is my hero. And I'll tell you a story a little later. I may, I maybe, maybe I shouldn't, but I'll tell you something about Paul a little later. How much God has used this man, his life, his writings to impact me as a Christian. But I want to go to Philippians chapter 1. Paul wrote this in prison. When Paul wrote this letter by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to emphasize this as a broken record, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You're not reading the opinions of these men. You're reading the words that these men were taught to record by the power of the Holy Spirit. As he wrote this letter in Philippians chapter 1, we're going to read 7, but we're going to pick it up at 6. Note the reason why Paul is in prison. Paul, why are you in prison? Why did they chain you up and lock you up? He tells you in verse 7. Philippians chapter 1, we're going to read 6 and 7. And Brother Nate, if you don't mind, God bless you, brother, for serving us for the sake of the Lord.
That's our confidence, amen? The work he began in you is not in vain. He will complete it in you for the glory of Christ, amen? That's our confidence. But then notice verse 7. Read that one more time, that last part, and you can stop there. In my chains and what? You know why I'm here chained up? Because of the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Can anyone guess what that Greek word is for defense? Because remember, when Paul wrote this, it's in Greek, right? When he says, I'm in prison because of the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Can anyone guess what that word was? apologetics it's apologia paul is saying i'm in prison because i'm an apologist sent to confirm the truth of the gospel and he uses that word again in verse 16 now the king james if you how many are reading the king james if the king ain't on it the king ain't in it amen all right now in the king james verse 16 is your verse 17 it's a different versification so he's going to read 16. Now we're catching it in the middle of a context. I don't have time to, to unpack, but I exhort you to read the entire chapter to see what the context is in verse 16. But in the King James, it's verse 17. So if you're reading King James, look at 17. He's going to be reading 16, I believe, unless the new King James. Oh, so the new King James follows the same because it's new. What was wrong with the old king? But anyway, read 17. God appointed me to defend the gospel. God appointed me to be an apologist, to do apologetics. Whether you like it or not, folks, part of your evangelism includes defending the gospel. And when you defend the gospel, you are an apologist for the King of kings and Lord of lords. But I'm going to repeat it again. How can you defend a faith that you do not know? So you have to know this word. And you're, you don't want to know the word simply to defend it as if God is in need of defense attorneys. God doesn't need anything. We need him. And it's an honor to be used of God to glorify the name of Jesus and defend the truth of the gospel. It's an honor that the creator of the heavens and the earth would take a maggot like me and fill me with the spirit to proclaim Christ crucified and destroy any and all obstacles stopping people from knowing the only hope of salvation. It is an honor, and we need to honor him. Let's look at a final passage, and we'll go into some of the objections. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Now, I love the language of Paul. Paul, you can, you can tell he was a Middle Easterner. In fact, if you read the book of Acts, wherever Paul went, riots occurred. Now, you don't start riots by just simply preaching, Jesus loves you. Let's sing Humbaya, we are the Lord. You don't start riots by just preaching a very wishy-washy, watered-down, effeminate gospel. You start riots when you are bold as a lion and getting in people's face in love and telling them Christ is the only hope of salvation. There is no other way. Your gods, your goddesses, they don't exist. Only Christ exists. That starts riots. That gets people to want to kill you and stone you and leave you for dead like they did to Paul in Acts 14. Verses 19 to 22. But let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 3 to 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 6. Notice what Paul says, he does, to objections, to arguments, to obstacles against the gospel of Jesus Christ. What does Paul do to such objections? He uses the language of warfare. See, we Christians, we have our own jihad. But our jihad is spiritual. We don't use the weapons of flesh. We use the weapons of the Spirit, which are mighty to destroy strongholds in the heavenly realms to set the captives free from the bondage of Satan. So I am a Christian jihadi, but a Christian jihadi doesn't take a gun or a bomb and blows you up. He takes the sword of the Spirit and slays you in the Spirit to take you captive for King Jesus. And that's what Paul says. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 to 6. 
2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 to 6. Casting down arguments, demolishing arguments. This is what Christians are called to do. Because whether you like it or not, folks, we don't live in a Christian America anymore. We live in a post-modern, in fact, I wouldn't even say secular, I would say highly pagan, idolatrous Western nation that will accept anything and anyone except Jesus Christ. So whether you like it or not, you're going to have objections. In the context of Islam, they have objections. But I don't want to discourage you. I want to encourage you. And I hope these passages embolden you. You are more than conquerors. And you have everything you need to take the hearts of Muslims captive for the glory of Christ. There's nothing to fear. And you don't need to be a scholar. You don't need to be a scholar. All you need to do is trust that the Holy Spirit is real and alive and will fill you with such wisdom and knowledge that even those with PhDs cannot stand and resist the wisdom that Christ has given you. But you have to believe. You have to believe. Let me give you the promise of our Lord. A promise given to the apostles but extended to us who follow in their footsteps. Let's go to Luke 21, 14 and 15. Let me repeat as you go to Luke 21, 14 and 15. Let me repeat. You don't need to be a scholar. You don't need to have a PhD. All you need to do is submit and surrender to the Holy Spirit and give him your all and he will fill you with such wisdom to confound the scholars of this age. That's Jesus' promise, right? Luke 21, 14 and 15, what does our Lord say? And again, it comes down to, do you believe this? Obviously you do, that's why you're here. You believe the Bible. You believe the Bible is God's voice and you can trust every promise of Scripture or you wouldn't be here, right? So you believe what Jesus says. I will give you a mouth and a wisdom that no one can refute. That's Jesus' promise. I will give you a mouth and a wisdom that no one can refute. But do you believe it that he's able? Read it for me, brother. So he's like, man, is he reading it or I'm going to read it? No, you're going to read it. <laughs> now, do you believe that? It reminds me of the story of Lazarus when he died. When I say story, obviously, I mean it's actual history. When I say story, I'm not saying make-believe. Actual historical event. And whenever I, I, I read the story, it moves me in my, my heart and spirit because there you'll find the shortest verse, English verse. English verse in the Bible, it's John 11.35. The shortest English verse in the Bible, John 11.35, it says Jesus wept. Two words in your English Bible. Jesus wept. Now, the context of the weeping, if I break it down, I mean, I don't have time. I'm not here to preach a sermon, but I encourage you again. Read John 11. The Lord deliberately stayed back, allowing Lazarus to die. Word had reached the Lord that Lazarus was sick, and he could have reached him in time to heal him, but he allowed him to die in order to demonstrate his resurrection power. <laughs> Martha comes out weeping, and her, even her testimony, even though her life had been shattered, <clears throat> even though she had lost her brother, <clears throat> she still didn't lose her faith because it says, Lord, and I'm reading from 20 to 22, Lord, had you been here, my brother would not have died. Had you made it in time, you could have healed my brother. But then she says something. This is faith speaking in the midst of heartache and pain and depression. This is faith speaking. But even now, I know God will give you whatever you ask. You understand her words? Even death is nothing before you. Because if you ask the Father, he will give you my brother back from the dead. See, that's faith speaking in the midst of heartache, heartbreak, and sadness. No matter what I see externally, I know you are the beloved of the Father. And whatever you ask, the Father will give you. And then Jesus says something powerful. Your brother shall rise again. Now she's, being a Jewish woman, she's been taught that yes, at the last day, 
the dead will be raised at the, at the day of judgment. And that's what she says. Yes, Lord, I know that he'll rise at the last day, day of resurrection. And then Jesus says, everything Jesus says is powerful. I was going to say some of the most powerful. Everything he says is powerful. But here, specifically, he looks at her and he says, I am the resurrection and the life. You don't have to wait for the resurrection. He's standing right here before your eyes. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And then he says this. And he who believes and lives shall never die. But he didn't stop there. He said, do you believe this? See, that's the question Jesus asks. People who believe in him. Now, Martha was a believer. She was someone who loved Jesus, adored Jesus, had Jesus in her home. And he still asks her, Martha, do you believe this? I know those outside who don't believe, don't believe a word that I have to say. But I'm speaking to you, Martha. In spite of your tragedies, in spite of your heartache, do you still believe in who I am? And she responds, the response of faith, yes, Lord. I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God, he who is to come into the world. So my exhortation to you will be this. Do you believe the promises of Scripture? Do you believe the Holy Spirit can fill you with such power and wisdom that you will be more than thoroughly equipped to reach Muslims for the gospel of Christ? Do you believe this? I hope so. Because you have about 1.7 billion Muslims who need you to believe this because they're on their way to hell if you don't intervene and share the good news of Jesus Christ. So do you believe this? With that said, do I still have an hour and a half? Okay. Some of the theological challenges. Again, I'm just going to whet your appetite to go more deeper into the subjects. And praise God you have a brother here and his better half who's local who will be more than willing to meet with you and minister to you and teach you. And we have resources. I write for a website called AnsweringIslam.net. AnsweringIslam.net. And so we have about, what, 10,000 pages of detailed arguments to equip you so you are thoroughly equipped for the task. So I'm just going to whet your appetite on some of the challenges of Islam because whether you like it or not, Muslims have objections. Muslims have challenges. In fact, devout Muslims are commanded to convert you to Islam. We're not the only group in the world that has a commission. I don't want to say great commission because there's nothing great about Islam. But we're not the only ones in the world who believe that we received a scripture from the one true God commanding us to convert people to this way of life. The Quran exhorts every devout Muslim to invite non-Muslims to Islam. And thank our brother Nate, he has a Quran. Can you go to chapter 16, verse 125 of the Quran? So you have now the two largest religious groups in the world competing for converts. The two largest religious groups in the world, all zealous to convert others to their way of life because they're convinced their way is the right way and every other way is a way of destruction, a path of Satan. Chapter 16, verse 125. By the way, guys, my mouth is a little dry, so I'm going to be showering you with holy saliva, right? Every part of us is holy, even saliva. Chapter 16, verse 125. 16. Don't ever mention the number of the beast. Six, I'm kidding. 16, 125, if you read out loud. 16, 125. Now, it's going to be a little harder for him to navigate the Quran. It's not, just, it's not as easy as the Bible. 16, 125. Read aloud what the Quran commands every devout Muslim. One more time. I'm gonna, I'm actually, I'm going to put the mic by your mouth. Yeah. Do that. I want them yeah. to hear this command to the Muslims. Invite all to the way of your Lord with wisdom and kind advice. And only debate, them, only debate with them in the best manner. Surely your Lord alone best knows who has strayed from his way and who is rightly guided. So you guys caught it, right? If you're a devout Muslim, you believe this is the word of God, you have no choice but to invite people to Islam. It's not an option for the Muslims. This is why you have Muslims who are trained to debate and quote-unquote evangelize non-Muslims, specifically Christians. So they're studying. They're studying our Bible, not to understand it, but to attack it. They're studying New Testament scholarship, which unfortunately in the West, 
our enemies happen to be those from our own camp. You'd be surprised and shocked what quote-unquote Christian scholarship is producing by way of exposition and commentary in the Bible. I have commentaries by people who profess to be Christian who make statements that do more damage to the cause of Christ than any Muslim could dream of doing. I, some of you got shocked at what I just said. Let me repeat that again. I have commentaries produced within recent years by people from accredited seminaries. I'll even mention one. Dallas Theological Semin Seminary. Now, I closed many more doors. After hearing this, no one's going to, that's fine. I'd rather be biblically correct than pol politically correct. Scholars who claim to be conservative, who claim to believe that the Bible is inspired word of God. And yet, when you read their commentaries, they make such statements that are so destructive that if a Muslim reads it, he'll say, wait, this is a scholar, and he says this about this story in the Bible, and you want me to believe that this is inspired of God? Now, I can give you examples. I'll just give you one quick example. And I want to challenge you uh, to do this. Don't take my word for it. Find a local uh, Christian bookstore if we still have them. Pick up a commentary in Psalm 110, not by liberals, but by conservatives. Psalm 110. Psalm 110. According to our Lord Jesus, Psalm 110 was written by David under inspiration of the Holy Spirit about the Messiah. In Mark 12, 35 to 37. Mark 12, 35 to 37. Jesus asks a question that stumps the religious scholars of his day. He says, the Christ, whose son is he? The Messiah, whose son will he be? Now let me ask you that question. Ramin mentioned it. As a Muslim, he was shocked to find out that Jesus was an Israeli, a Jew, right? If I were to ask the Christians here, the Messiah, according to the Old Testament, was to be whose descendant, whose son? What's the answer? Son of David, right? He has to be from the household of David. But then Jesus confronts them. How is it then? This is Mark 12, 35, 37. I'm giving you the reference so you know I'm not making it up. How is it then that David by the Holy Spirit? See, now, not only does he say David wrote it, but he wrote it as the Holy Spirit revealed it to him. Did you catch Jesus' view of Psalm 110? It wasn't simply David who wrote it. He did so as the Holy Spirit revealed it to him. And what did he reveal to him? How is it that David, by the Holy Spirit, says, The Lord, the Father, in that context, says to my Lord, the Lord, count how many that is, the Lord, Yahovah, says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. David calls him Lord. How can he be his son? And it says they were stumped. They did not answer that. He quotes a psalm that Jesus says is written by David, where David, by the Holy Spirit, realizes that Jehovah says to my Lord. So that Lord of David, Jesus says, that's me. David was talking about me, the Messiah. And David knew that I, the Messiah, is his Lord who sits enthroned next to the Father. But Jesus, how could he know that? The Holy Spirit revealed it to him. Now, you think the case is closed. As a Christian, if Jesus said David wrote it, that's it, right? End of story? Oh, contrary. Go pick up a commentary by conservative Christians, and you know what they'll tell you? Maybe David wrote it, and if he did, he may have written it about Solomon, or it may have been a court poet who wrote it about David, or it may have been written when the Jews returned about some king. We really don't know who wrote it. And this is a conservative Christian who says he believes in Jesus Christ making my job harder to convince the Muslim that all of the Bible is inspired and all of it is reliable. When you have friends like that, that, who needs enemies? Who needs enemies, right? So beware of even so-called Christian scholarship. And this is why when people say, I want to go to seminary, I go, so you want to go to cemetery? Because you'll go in alive and come out dead. No better teacher than the Holy Spirit of the living God. No better teacher than the Holy Spirit of the living God. And by way of testimony, just to give God the glory, I've never been to college or seminary, and yet there isn't a scholar that can stand before me without the Holy Spirit giving me the power to silence his attacks on the Bible. Not because I'm anything, because the Holy Spirit is everything if you trust.
if you trust and believe. And I hope you're encouraged by Ramin and Muhammad and myself. Foolish things of the world standing before you with the wisdom of the Holy Spirit confounding the scholars of this age because your God is more real than you can imagine. But do you believe? Do you believe? Let's talk about at least two objections because my time will be up. Two objections. Wetting your appetite. There's a lot more. And one thing, I thank God for the Muslim debaters. You know why? What I thought was a curse in the beginning of my years as an evangelist when I first started dealing with Muslims and asked me questions I couldn't answer and causing me many a sleepless night. By way of testimony, I'm not lying. The Lord bear witness. There would be times I would cry myself to sleep because I didn't know how to answer the objections. There were times when they asked me questions. I'm not about the 90s. I've been in full-time ministry by the grace of God since 1999. I would, I would be asked questions and I would cry myself to sleep. And I remember one night, I looked to the Lord and I said, God, I don't know how to answer these questions. <clears throat> See, when I think about the goodness of God, it moves me in my heart. But please... <laughs> If you give me the answers, I promise, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I will make sure that no other Christian gets humiliated like these Muslims are humiliating me. And here I stand before you, testifying to a faithful God who has answered every objection, and there's not an objection that I have not heard that God has not refuted. Not so much to win an argument, but to win hearts and remove obstacles from them being receptive to the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you believe, you will receive, and he will do wonders through you. I'll repeat it again. If you believe, you will receive, and he will do wonders through you. And I'm an example of that. Two objections in particular. Now, we didn't have time to unpack every nuanced belief of the Muslims, but for the sake of time, Muslims believe that Islam is a religion of not Muhammad. It's a religion of all the prophets of the Bible, starting with Adam. They actually believe that Jesus is a Muslim. Abraham was a Muslim. The disciples were Muslims. The disciples were not Christians. Here, let me prove that to you. From the Quran, which they believe is the Word of God. So what was their religion? Islam. And Islam means submission or surrender. And so if anyone seeks to submit or surrender to God, Allah, in Arabic, he or she is a Muslim. So they'll tell you Abraham was a Muslim. His religion was Islam. Jesus was a Muslim. His religion was Islam. The disciples were Muslims. Their religion was Islam. Let me prove that to you. Chapter 3 of the Quran, verse 52. What was the religion of the apostles? Now, as he's turning there, before he reads it, I'm going to ask the Christian. Remember what Peter said? Always be prepared to give an answer, defense. So I'm going to ask the Christians, what was the religion of Abraham? Now, before you answer, I'm going to ask a related question. What was Abraham's religion and what was the religion of the apostles of Christ? Think about it after he reads these passages. Chapter 3, verse 52. Okay. When Jesus sensed disbelief, disbelief from his people, he asked, Who will stand up with me for God? The disciples replied, We will stand up for God. We believe in God, so bear witness that we have submitted. Doesn't translate the Arabic. It's bear witness, Jesus. The disciples, Peter, James, and John. Jesus, Isa, bear witness. We are Muslims. That's what it says in the Arabic. Did you know that Peter was a Muslim? Did you know that John was a Muslim? Now, to us, it's a laughing matter. But you have 1.7 billion Muslims who think this is the word of the God of Jesus. And because they think it's his word, they're convinced that Peter, James, John, they were Muslims. What about Abraham? What was Abraham? Chapter 3, verse 67, brother, if you don't mind. So I'm trying to answer that question. Do I have 10 minutes, 5 minutes? What do I have? 10 minutes, okay. I think I'm just going to have to deal with this objection just as a way of opening a door or a path for you to just sojourn on because the more you study, the stronger you'll become in your faith, the more wisdom you'll receive, and the more confidence you'll have this book and only this book is the voice of God, no other. And you'll be emboldened to reach Muslims because Muslims need Jesus. When I say this book, I don't mean that book. I'm sorry, brother. See how you are? You, see, you were set up to mislead. No, I'm kidding. 367. What does it say about Abraham? And then I'll have you another verse. All right. 367. 
says, Abraham was neither a Jew nor a Christian. He wasn't a Jew, he wasn't a Christian. Ha, 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 Christians. He submitted in all uprightness and was not a polytheist. Now, the literal translation isn't he submitted. Abraham was neither a Jew nor a Christian, but he was an upright Muslim. Are you catching what's happening in this book? All the biblical characters that you take for granted are mentioned in this book, and yet they've been hijacked and turned into Muslims like Muhammad. In fact, in chapter 22, verse 78 of the Quran, 2278, it says, this is, talking to Muhammad, 2278, you can note this down, this is the religion of your father Abraham. This is the religion of your father Abraham. That's what the, the, the Quran says. In 2278, note that down. This religion, Islam, is the religion of your father Abraham. Did you, get, you understand what that means? Muslims are the descendants of Abraham. Did you catch the verse? I'm going to repeat it again. This, this Islam, not Christianity, not Judaism, this Islam is the religion of your father Abraham. And he named you Muslims both now and before. See what the Quran says? Allah, the God of Abraham, named you Muslims. And he named them Muslims. Would you seek another path? Would you seek another path? If the religion of Abraham is Islam, why are you a Christian? If the religion of Abraham is Islam, why are you a Jew? What's wrong with you guys? So here's the challenge. This is probably the only objection I can answer. Here's the challenge. What was the religion of Abraham? And what was the religion? Now, please don't tell me. I don't have religion. I have relationship. I know that's preachy. It's not true. You have religion. James 1, 26, 27 says you have a pure religion from God. James 1, 26 to 27. Let's be biblicists because I used to hear that preaching. I, I got relationship, not religion. No, you got both. If the Bible is your authority, you have a relationship and a way of life. And that's what a religion is. Don't believe me? Read James 1, 26 to 27. And he tells you the pure religion before God is to keep yourself undefiled from the world and to visit orphans and widows. That's the pure religion before God. So please, let's not come up with any of this. I don't have a religion. I, you have both a relationship and a way of life. And that way of life is your religion. And your religion comes from the scriptures. Why do you think you have a list of do's and don'ts and suggestions? Do this, don't do that. And I suggest, if you want to be celibate, amen, but that's not a command. Not everyone has it. So you have suggestions and do's and don'ts. Well, what is a religion if not a way of life telling you what to do, what not to do, and suggestions? So you have a religion. So here's my question for every one of you. What was the religion of Abraham? What was the religion of the apostles? I have about eight minutes to unpack this, and hopefully it whet your appetite, got you excited to want to explore deeper. What's the answer, Christians? What was Abraham's religion? Okay, Muslims have faith. Faith in what? Do you believe Abraham believed in the one true God? And he desired to submit himself to the one true God? You just admit he's a Muslim, because that's what Islam is. See how I set you up? Let me repeat how I set you up. You believe Abraham believed in one true God? You said yes. Did he desire to submit to the one true God? Yes. Well, Islam means submission to the one true God. So you just admit he's a Muslim. So why are you a Christian? For the sake of time, I'm going to give you the answer. But what was the religion of the apostles? That should be easy. What was their religion? Man, you guys are killing me. So then if they were Jews, then why are you a Christian? You, you understand? You, how, the contradiction there. If you're telling me they're Jews, then why in the world are you a Christian then? No, they were Christians. What is a Christian? What does that mean? What does the word Christian mean? I know you know, brother. I'm asking them. Astaghfirullah Rabbil Alameen. A'udhu Billah min Muhammad Rajim. Anyway. All right. What was their religion? Christian, right? What does Christian mean? Okay. Um, if you want to... That literally, but means a follower of Christ, right? Follower of Christ. Let me show you what the Holy Spirit says your name, your label should be. The Holy Spirit says that your name, your label should be Christian. I'm going to give it to you from the Holy Spirit. Go to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 14 and 16. 
1 Peter chapter 4, verse 14 and 16. We're going to skip 15 for the sake of time. And brother, you can just read out loud. I'll just hold on to the mic if you want. Just read out loud. Pay attention. Now, if someone asks you, what is your religion? Christian. Why do you call yourself Christian? Because the Holy Spirit calls me a Christian. Where does he call you a Christian? 1 Peter 4, 14. And then we're going to jump to 16. Read 14 out loud so they can hear you. So now understand, if you're being insulted because you bear the name of Christ, keep that in mind. What does it mean, the name of Christ? He's going to tell you in a minute, but finish. Let me explain what that means. If they insult you because you bear the name of Christ, you got God's spirit resting upon you, he will glorify you. The spirit of God and glory means that spirit of God is, is bringing you into glory. So rejoice. Because your destiny is glory with Jesus. But what does it mean to bear the name of Christ? You don't need to guess. He tells you in verse 16. Verse 16, he tells you. What's it, what does it mean to bear the name of Christ? As a Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, Jew, if anyone suffers as a Christian, what does he say finish it? So beware of some movements that say, when you're talking to Muslims, don't say you're a Christian. Say you're a follower of Esau. There are people out there that will tell you that. So wait, wait. You're telling me that Peter was wrong to say, don't be ashamed that you are called a Christian. Because when you hesitate to tell someone you're a Christian, that means you're embarrassed by that name. So are you more spirit-filled than Peter was? Peter was not ashamed to say, I am a Christian. How dare you be ashamed of bearing that title when you claim to be walking in the same spirit that Peter walked in? What was the religion of Abraham? He wasn't a Jew. Because what does a Jew mean? I thought Jews were the descendants of Abraham. How can he be his own descendant? A Jew historically means from the tribe of Judah. But Judah was a descendant of Abraham, and then it meant an inhabitant of the land of Judea, right? So if you want to say, well, he was an inhabitant of Judea, he was a Jew in that sense. But it's, it's anachronistic to say Abraham was a Jew when Jews did not exist at that time. And by the way, you can be ethnically a Jew, but not a Jew religiously. Because you have many ethnic Jews who are Christians, and you have many ethnic Jews who are atheists. And you have many ethnic Jews who for some reason become Hindus or Buddhists. Go figure. So being a Jew is more of an ethnic mo mo uh, moniker than it is a religious identity. Right? Abraham was a Christian. Let me repeat. Abraham was a Christian. If you believe Jesus, you're going to have to believe he was a Christian. Because what is a Christian? A follower of Christ. Right? Jesus said they were all Christians. I even gave you an example. Did not Jesus say David called the Messiah his Lord? Wait, wait, wait. Unpack that. I don't know if you're unpacking that. Jesus says God revealed to David, the Holy Spirit revealed to David that the Messiah is his Lord and he confessed him as such. That means David knew who the Messiah was. In order for him to know the Messiah is his Lord and write about him, that means he knew of the Messiah, believed in the Messiah. That means he was a Christian. So are we really understanding what we're reading? Because if you really understand what you're reading, the answer is they were all Christians because they all lived in anticipation of the Messiah to come. Let me show you from Jesus himself in John chapter 8, 39 to 40. John 8. So don't take my word for it. Put down the stones. Don't stone me. I'm simply telling you what the master says. These are the words of the master. Jesus tells me they all believed in me. They all looked to my coming. They all hoped in me. They all trusted in me. That means they were all Christians waiting for Messiah to appear. You don't believe me? Now here, I'm going to need you to speak in the mic loud because I want to see if you catch it. John 8, 39 to 40. Let me start at 38. The, the, the context All right. The Jews are saying, we are sons of Abraham. And Jesus says, no, you're not. These unbelieving Jews, no, you're not. You're not sons of Abraham. Let me prove it to you. That's the context. Yeah. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. 
But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Listen to this. Say Abraham, this out loud. Say it out loud. This part. Abraham did not do this. Now pause right there. Don't go anywhere. Here's the proof that you Jews, though ethnically Jews, you're not really Jews and you don't really belong to Abraham. You're trying to kill me. A man who's told you the truth he's heard from God. Abraham didn't try to do that. See, if I was there, I'd be scratching my head. What? We're trying to kill you? Something Abraham didn't try to do? Abraham didn't do what? What's the answer? Abraham didn't do what? You're trying to kill me. Something Abraham didn't try to do. Help me, Christians. I'm not that smart. Abraham didn't do what? Try to kill who? My first question would be, wait, wait, hey, uh, Jesus, I don't know who you are. Because at that time, they didn't know who he was, right? Abraham's been dead for 2,000 years. How in the world can you say Abraham didn't try to kill you? He's been dead for 2,000 years. Then he gives you the answer, John 8, 56. I'm going to read it. John 8, 56. Now, notice the words of our Lord and be in awe of this one who is life itself. Jesus is our life, the Father's heart to us. John 8, 56. Lest you think I'm reading too much into his words or misunderstanding, notice the reaction of Abraham when he saw Jesus. John 8, 56. Truly, truly, I say to you, your father Abraham, your father Abraham rejoiced at seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. Wow. Wait, 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 Jesus. You're saying Abraham saw you? You better believe he did. That's John 8, 56. Don't take my word for it. Open and read it. It's there. It's your Bible, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And you have to believe every word of that book. And he says, your father Abraham rejoiced to see me. He saw me and was glad, unlike you. That's basically what he's saying. Now they ask the natural question that anyone in his right mind would ask. In verse 57, the Jew said, you're not yet 50 years old. You're not even 50, guy. Abraham's been dead for 2,000 years, and you have seen Abraham? What are you talking about? And notice the words of the master. Truly, truly, I say unto you, before Abraham came into being, I am. In other words, what he's saying? Don't let my physical appearance mislead you. I'm much older than 50. I'm even older than your father, Abraham. I was there even before Abraham existed. I saw him and he saw me. Now they picked up the stones to stone him. That's their reaction. You know what your reaction should be? On your knees, praising him. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You truly are the God of Abraham. But to answer the question, if Abraham saw Jesus and Jesus saw Abraham and Abraham rejoiced to see Jesus and believed in Jesus, by golly, that makes him a Christian. He's no Muslim. With that said, my time is up. Thank you. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Amen.